We are back for one more show before we take a break for a few weeks, and we are making it a great one. Coach, analyst, and film savant Maddie Brown joins the Cigar Lounge to break down Seattle's offseason, including a deep dive into their 2024 draft class. Let's light them up. I'm Jackson Bevins, and this is Cigar Thoughts. Welcome back to the Cigar Lounge. I am Jackson Bevins, and along with my jet-setting producer, Mike Barwin, this is the Cigar Thoughts podcast. Mike, how are we doing today? We are doing great, Jackson. I know that this is a football show, but the NBA playoffs have me feeling some type of way right now. So I'm basking in the glow of a conference yeah, big, finals appearance. Big for the Minnesota Anthony Timberwolves. Edwards fans in the yes, cigar lounge. Huge, huge <laughs> fans. So, Hey man, the basketball has been great. Uh, football season is cruising right now. And you know, there's, there's still a lot to talk about before we head into our little hiatus here. So how are you doing? Oh man, I'm, I'm, I'm doing great. And you and I, we got some exciting things ahead of us here in our personal lives. You know, we, we were able to line up some travel with some of the slow season, even though lots is happening right now, it's, it's a little bit kind of churning at the bottom of the barrel that's going on with the NFL season right now. And I mean, Mike, you got a hell of a trip ahead of you. Yeah, that's right. It's summer break. So it's time to, uh, head transatlantic. Yeah, bopping all over the place, and I'll actually end up uh, towards the end in England to kick our aforementioned guest's ass. So it'll, <laughs> it'll be a good time. So yeah, what about man. yourself? Where are you headed? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm stoked you're going to be able to meet up with Maddie over there. I am also headed to Europe. You know, uh, I married Polish, and for the first time, I'm going to get a chance to go to Poland, see the old country, see where my wife grew up. And, you know, we were so fortunate to bring over more than a dozen of her family members to surprise her mom for her 60th birthday last summer. And this year we're going to head over for a birthday celebration for one of her cousins and spend a couple of weeks in Poland. I can't wait. I got my Duolingo streak going here. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, what's your confidence level at yeah, right now? Yeah. Uh, low still, but I got, I got another couple of weeks before we take off to, to really bone up. Cause it's one thing, when Polish come over to you, you learn a little bit so that you can have some conversation, but it's it's still in America. The onus is kind of on them. It's a different thing to have very baseline Polish knowledge when you're in Poland. And yeah, they got goal, home court advantage at that point. They absolutely do. And, and my goal is to reduce the burden on them to translate for me while while I'm over there. So yeah, man, I'm I'm so excited. You know, it, it it's one of those things where with my wife, I mean, sh- I, I've never seen anybody better at what they do than what my wife does. She's incredible, and she's doing it in her second language. She's doing it in her second country. And to be able to get out of my comfort zone where she has been forced, essentially, to make a life and go into her heritage and and just see the history right like america doesn't have thousand year old buildings i can't wait to see that stuff so yeah i'm i'm super excited man it's it's going to be a really cool thing i'm excited to get to know my wife better through the experience get to know her family better it's going to be awesome that sounds like a rich tapestry of uh family history that you're about to uh check out and in the meantime, I will be getting pissed in some dank pub in the middle of who knows where in England. So I would expect nothing right. less from you, man. No, and, we've, and we've got we've got some we've got some good stuff packed into there as well, some exploration and all that stuff. But oh yeah, no, I know you're going to make the most of it. And and look, I'm I'm going to miss doing the show, but I am excited for the opportunity we both have to travel. I can't wait to hear all about your journey. And in the meantime, we do have a banger of a guest ready to join us. But before he does, I want to remind everyone listening that Cigar Thoughts is proud to be sponsored by Seattle Cigar Concierge and Glenfiddich Single Malt Scotch Whiskey, two companies of incredible quality. We are so happy to have them on board. And the big news, as many of you already know, we have teamed back up with Seattle Cigar Concierge for an exciting second release of the Cigar Thoughts Cigars. That's right. It's the Cigar Thoughts Red Zone Series. It's what I'm smoking right now. 
It combines a robust taste profile with a smooth Connecticut wrapper, and it will be available to purchase using the link on the show page for the same discounted price of $149 for a bundle of 10 stogies that you're used to with the Cigar Thoughts Originals. My goal with these releases is to provide an avenue to high-end cigars without the high-end cost, and this partnership provides exactly that. They make a great gift as well, so get some for yourself or for someone else by following the link at CigarThoughtsNFL.com. Also, on draft day, we asked y'all to predict the Seahawks' first pick, with the winner getting a free bundle of the new Red Zone cigars, and today, we announced the winner. Mike, who we got? We had quite a few people predict that Byron Murphy would uh, would be the selection at 16. Great so. response to the question, man. We had so many people time. We had over 100 guesses on this one. The listeners, the listeners were on it. So shout out everybody that participated. And after uh, after plugging all of the entrants into the random number generator, the winner who receives a bundle of the Cigar Thoughts Red Zone series is Richard Thrust, <laughs> which <laughs> see is par for the course for the show, right? At El Dudorino seventy two. So shout Let's out go. Richard. Shout out Richard. Let's go. We, will, we will be getting Richard in contact Thrust. with you What's up, man? Hey, we're we're gonna reach out to you on Twitter. We're gonna get your address on the DM. You've got a bundle of the Cigar Thoughts Red Zone cigars coming your way. And look, Mike and I, we love doing the show. And there are two ways y'all listening and watching can help support it so that we can keep the episodes coming. One is by purchasing the cigars, which again, come at an astonishing price for the quality. The other is by subscribing to our YouTube channel at Cigar Thoughts, where you can watch full episodes as well as the funny and insightful clips that Mike puts together. Give a thumbs up to the stuff you like and let us know what you think in the comments. And of course, you can listen to us everywhere you get your podcasts. Now, one of my favorite things about doing this show is it provides the opportunity to talk ball with really smart people, and today is no exception. Our guest is no stranger to longtime listeners of the show. He is the defensive coordinator for the London Olympians of the British American Football League. He co-hosts the Seattle Overload podcast with Griff Sturgeon and provides some of the best film breakdowns you'll ever see on Twitter. He is Maddie F. Brown. Maddie, thanks for joining us. What's up? Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, so are we, man. And a lot of it is because a lot has happened since last time we had you on the show. And, you know, you've you've got such a unique combination of experience, intellect, and then the ability to translate that to fans. And it's one of the reasons Mike and I was so looking forward to having you on this show, this last show before we take a break. And look, we're going to talk about the draft. That that's still the most recent thing. It's the biggest event of the off season, and you know we're going to get your thoughts on all of that stuff. But the Seahawks have a lot of new faces, and that started before the draft with free agency. And this is especially true on defense. And and I'm curious how you think they'll fit. You know, on on top of that, it's a new coaching staff with considerable recent success but a lot less experience in their current roles than, you know, what we're used to as Seahawks fans. So, you know, we are going to get into the rookies shortly, but first talk to me about your impressions of Seattle's free agency period. Like, where do you think this team upgraded? Where do you think they've gotten worse from last year? Upgraded? Huh? I don't, I don't know necessarily if, if they upgraded anywhere, but it will be interesting to see how certain things play out. And I think my main takeaway from the whole free agency period is, they're creating an opportunity for people to win jobs and there's not necessarily like a clear position where that guy's got their job for more than a season or or two. We've how the contracts are constructed as well, so many expiring after 2025. There's that kind of opportunity for guys to take jobs, guys to step up. Um, you know, maybe Tyrell Dodson works out, maybe he won't. Maybe Tyrese Knight ends up taking his job as a rookie. Maybe one of the guys like Patrick O'Connell, who's been on the roster for a while, steps up. You know, that type of stuff. Even at safety where they're, they've added, you know, Rayshon Jenkins, there's no reason that Kayvon Wallace couldn't take uh, Rayshon Jenkins' job uh, and vice versa, right? Now, they may, they may well play with multiple safeties. I expect they'll play with three quite a lot of the time. But there's that type of uh, competition element which translates to the offense as well, where at guards, you know, I think, the issue with the offensive line was they couldn't stay healthy and Geno Smith was pressured far too often, like 40 
40.2% of dropbacks pressure, which is sixth <laughs> most. Insane. But if you take away the Titans and then the stylistic quarterbacks who are almost creating pressure, and Gino's a pocket pass, so he didn't get sacked much despite that. Um, I think, you know, the offensive line, it, it was disappointing in their results last year, but in terms of the actual talent, it was just the health was the big issue there. And mm-hmm. you look at the offensive line this year, and it's kind of, again, the, the, the prove it aspect. If you've got a vet and availability seems to be the theme, which has continued in their drafting as well. And Lake and Tomlinson coming in with, with all of his career starts in a row. And it's like, okay, that's, that's great. But then right guard Anthony Bradford, who wasn't meant to be the starter last year, was thrust into some action and... Well, he, you know, he it was a challenge for him. Maybe he'll be better, better in his second year. But you know, Ankrum is, you know, maybe the the guy who'd uh, take his job out of the vets that they signed in the free agency. And again, though, it's you know, short term deals mm-hmm. where hey, if you're if you're all right, then that's good. But also, there's nothing stopping a rookie from making this very much one year stint in the Pacific Northwest. So. Yeah, and and for those who are hearing Maddie for the first time, it's just a little bit of a preview of his knowledge of the depth of this roster, you know, and and there are so many moves that don't make headlines that happen in free agency. You know, roster size is enormous. They don't have to cut it down for months. And so they are churning the bottom of that 90-man roster a lot. We don't need to cover all of that, but some of the bigger moves that Seattle made in free agency and and, you know, as usual, they sat out the first round, first two rounds of free agency. Uh, that's a process I don't hate. But to your point, this is new staff, and everyone is kind of on a tryout. I would say specifically on defense. I feel like everybody except for Devin Witherspoon and Leonard Williams is is trying out for their future with this team. And there is a lot of opportunity because you don't, especially now with someone like Quandre Diggs, Jamal Adams leaving, Jordan Brooks and Bobby Wagner, these stalwarts are gone. It opens up a lot of starting opportunities. There are a few moves specifically that I want to talk to you about. Some of them are free agent acquisitions. One was a trade. Let's start with linebacker. You know, you mentioned Jerome Baker, Tyrell Dodson. They came in there essentially replacing Jordan Brooks and Bobby Wagner. Like me, you're a Jordan Brooks guy. Talk to me about the decision to let the linebackers go from last year and what you think the team saw in Baker and Dodson. Well, yeah, yeah. Jordan Brooks, obviously, as you said, I'm a big fan of his game ever since he came out. And I think his uh, well, I, I think his game is largely underappreciated by most people. I'd call him underrated. I think his biggest issue was staying healthy. I also wonder how that type of timeline played out. With you know, obviously they understandably prioritized uh, signing Leonard Williams. He goes and signs in Miami. It felt like maybe Seattle could have got that done. Maybe they're taken by surprise. We'll, we'll never know. But letting him walk, because I, I, I believe his potentials is a top five, but all pro type Mike linebacker in the league, mm-hmm. which, I mean, that may seem strong to some people. But that's, that's what I see. Uh, it just, like I said, the health was the issue. And as you've mentioned, Jackson, all this new coaching staff, I don't actually think what they do schematically is too different to what Seattle was doing, particularly in the last two seasons. But... Obviously, uh, McDonald with uh, a linebacker coaching background, what he looks for from linebackers, which also shows up in the draft pick as well. Um, but with Tyrell Dodson in, uh, in particular, it seems slightly different to the previous Seattle tree. And mm-hmm. obviously, that Seattle tree, we had so many years of, of data of what they're looking for from, from their linebackers. Uh, so, yeah, Dodson, he's, he's kind of dense. He's... For his size, he's a kind of a thumper, kind of a downhill type player, and he can he can move a bit. And I imagine he's the mic in certain situations. And then when they need him to play kind of more in the weak side role, then they will do that with him, which often would be for a coverage reason. And then they'll use Jerome Baker as the mic, who I think comes in as the will. I think Baker plays more football. He's obviously been paid more money as well. Uh, he he's all right. He's all right. Uh, there's some stuff that Miami didn't ask him to do that maybe 
McDonald will ask him to do and that he can do, which is kind of high value linebacker play that just, you know, usage versus what can you do is always a thing. Let me, let me ask you a little bit more about that because you, you've mentioned that we have a a large data set in terms of what Seattle has looked for in their off ball linebackers. Mm Mm-hmm. You are a defensive coordinator. Seattle hired a defensive coordinator as their head coach. When you look at how Mike McDonald has used his linebackers in the past, can you just give us a quick difference in what is being asked of players at that position between what we've seen in Seattle and what we've seen in Baltimore? Yeah, so there is some schematic similarity, to be honest with you. I think it's more just, like, I think they've asked to do very similar things, to be honest. I don't, I don't necessarily think there's a difference there. It's just okay. when you get up on the board um, in the draft room, it's kind of what traits you're prioritizing over others. Like to them having, and, you know, it's just one season. It's just one sample size, one off season. But in Seattle, I think now they're going for guys who maybe they're a bit slower, but they're, they're emphasizing really kind of toughness uh, play in between the tackles uh, for Mike and maybe he's more open McDonald to a guy who's like a first and second down type player. Uh, but I don't want to draw two massive, you know, conclusions from that. I just think it's something I'm paying attention to, right. Mm-hmm. Uh, particularly with Brooks departing and how the linebacker room looks this year with Dodson and, and Baker and how with the safeties that they have, the, <laughs> the amount of safeties on the roster right now, how maybe, they substitute and get into sub package stuff like he did with the Ravens. Um, but let's not forget the Ravens had two very good linebackers, one very, very good linebacker, Rokon Smith, who before he joined, that was a middling type defense. When he joined, he, uh, when they traded for him, he took that defense to a completely different level. So yes. you would think McDonald would be aware of that, but I also think, um, well, I'm just really interested to see what the system looks like with the the linebackers he has right now because linebackers, obviously, you need them to do a bit of everything in the in the system. Uh, McDonald needs that too. Maybe he evolves to uh, using more three safety packages. I, I know he used Kyle Hamilton in a in a big nickel role, but the the types of safety Seattle have aren't obviously Kyle Hamilton. So, yeah, I, I'm fascinated to see how this this defense shakes out. And and not to paint you with too broad of a brush here, but you didn't shed a lot of tears, I'm guessing, about their decision to let Bobby Wagner move on and become a commander. Is that accurate? <clears throat> um, I'm very pleased for Bobby Wagner because he not only is he going to be a Hall of Fame uh, linebacker, but he's also, I mean, if there was a Hall of Fame for agents, I'm sure there are. <laughs> But he's he is he is doing a damn good job for himself. So good for him. I'm I'm happy for Bobby Wagner. Um, yeah, it's just it's it's yeah it's funny. Like the the whole Jordan Brooks like is he a Mike thing in what was an abysmal 2022 defense, just in so many facets. And then you know one quote gets said about like how he's adjusting to it, and then suddenly it's like everyone's like, oh maybe he's not that type of uh, signal caller. Maybe he can't wear the green dot. It's like. Looking at what a Mike was asked to do in Seattle system, what a Mike would be asked to do in McDonald system, Brooks can do all of that stuff. When Bobby Wagner returns, and I think culturally as well, that must have been a bit weird because players would have gravitated towards, um, you know, hey, it's a new era. Who's going to be the new leader? Who's going to step up? Ah, the old guy who we all love and respect is back. Now it's kind of the the dynamics have shifted a bit more. Sure. But yeah, he just he just couldn't move like he used to, obviously. But what that also meant was when they're playing him at the mic spot, because that's what he's done his whole career. Uh, you know that that impacts the defense even more. Like the Rams, uh, when they were using him, they put him into the boundary or the weak side of the formation. They basically played him like a will, and he was in less space with less kind of you need speed assignments, and even then would get picked on at times. When Seattle got him back, they were like. We're going to put you right down the middle of our defense and we're going to ask you uh, <laughs> to kind of be that, that classic Mike linebacker in like a 4-3 uh, type structure. And they didn't ask him to do things that his, his movement couldn't do. So they kind of simplified what they were asking him him to do in a, in a sense or or maybe the better phrase for that would be they, they were slightly limited in what they could call. And 
and he just still couldn't really move. So like, there's just limitations to it. Um, and he played some really good football and he played like he played, he's still really smart and he's still really tough and he can still do lots of good things. It's just, you're putting him in a very important position and you're also playing a scheme where it would have been very nice to have a player. Like, I don't know, like uh, Jordan Brooks uh, <laughs> with that skill set doing that thing. So yeah, but I, I respect, uh, you know, it's very Pete Carroll to go out with, um, with one of his guys like in the middle like that's um it's so it's funny it's a, it's a relationships thing and uh yeah maybe it, it was sad to, to see um bobby wagner's blocked me on twitter so it clearly uh <laughs> i was maybe a bit, i didn't think i was that vocal about it but um, <laughs> but the point being there as well right it, you can't you couldn't ignore the impact of it like you know I, yeah I, even if you watch the broadcast right um Anyway, but franchise legend, and good for him reuniting with uh, Ken Norton Jr. as well. I'm sure they'll uh, sure. do some things. And Dan Quinn, I mean, they had Maybe. some good years together for sure. There you yeah, go. you know, it, and, and it's one of those things. I mean, I'm sure you can speak to it with your experience. You've been coaching for eight years now. And, and you know, having a guy in the locker room that commands that level of respect from teammates has to have value beyond what shows up on film beyond what shows up in the analytics or, or even in your baseline box score, you know, kind of having that coach on the field and that mentor in the locker room. It's just at some point it does come down to what happens on the field. And uh, yeah, I think, I think Seattle squeezed all the juice out of Bobby Wagner that, that there was to get, I want to move back to the secondary here because Seattle has had some really great safety play for a long time with some blips along the way. But of course you had the legends and Earl Thomas and Cam Chancellor. And then not too long after you had Quandre Diggs, you know, Jamal Adams, there, a lot has come out about a, a supposed disconnect between how Pete Carroll wanted to use Jamal Adams and how John Schneider envisioned him being used when oh, trading for that. him. Yeah, please. Yeah. That to I, this, this is insane. Like this narrative is actually insane. I, I, I appreciate people, uh, some of the people who've been talking about that disconnect. They obviously have some sources, but to me that comes across as now, uh, obviously my take on it, right? It's my opinion. Yep. Uh, it's my take on it. Um, so listen, <laughs> um, so comes across as front office brain and front office descriptions of maybe usage and stuff compared to coaching brain and coaching descriptions of stuff. So what is a box safety, right? As someone who plays in the box, if people watch Cam Chancellor now, right, they'd be like, oh, he's playing outside linebacker because that's what he used to do in Seattle. He's playing inside linebacker uh, in the mic position because that's what he used to do in Seattle, right? Oh, he's playing deep safety because that's what he used to do in Seattle. He's playing post safety because that's what he used to do in Seattle. He's playing Will because that's what he used to do in Seattle. And he's playing uh, safety on the slot. So he's playing nickel because that's what he used to do in Seattle, right? I don't understand how a franchise where you had uh, like a true unicorn who tied all of those defenses together in terms of, uh, you know, you have a defensive call. He tied all of those calls together in, in Seattle in that great defense. And he was the kind of true chess piece player how can you ha your franchise have like w the best person to do it? And then suddenly when Jamal Adams is a subject, people just have a complete like, what? what, what is this? Is he a linebacker? So, okay. Yeah, he is in layman's terms. He's lining up in linebacker positions, but for, for John Schneider and Pete Carroll not to be on the same page with how uh, Jamal Adams was being used does not make any sense to me. Because in 2020, they ran a system which was accent, accenting his skill set and using yes. him to pressure off the edge. They'd, they'd, sh they'd have five guys down at the line. They would, um, in by the way, what looked like a 3-4 look. Um, and uh, they'd, that would give him easy pass protection looks and Jamal Adams would blitz. And he was very effective at that. He was also pretty damn good at covering the underneath zones before he got hurt. 
2021, they then played him as a deep safety in a deep quarter. And again, one quote gets overblown where it's like he's having to adapt to that a bit. And then suddenly everyone's like, oh, he can't do that. He mm -hmm. played at LSU in Dave Aranda's scheme, which is well renowned for using uh, quarters, right? And that type mm -hmm. of safety who's playing in a deep, too high shell. And Jamal Adams in Seattle did really well at that too. And again, tied the defense together playing a bit deeper. Uh, and they're, they're transitioning to more too high coverages, okay? And he was that that's kind of high safety. So I don't like the sacked production went down, but, uh, and I did actually feel in that year, they could have potentially used him as a blitzing threat a bit more often. Yes, absolutely. Uh, maybe, maybe they kind of got the balance wrong there, but they're playing damn good defense towards the end of the year towards the, uh, but you know, we, we just described two aspects of the, the kind of chess piece safety play that I was speaking about. Uh, when it comes to Cam Chancellor, and that's what that's what Jamal Adams when he was healthy was, but there's yes. such a, a in a, in his own way, right? He's not. I'm not saying he's the he's not six foot three, like two forty plus pounds. He's a frenetic kind of ball of energy who uh, is 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 denser and squatter, but uh, then can do you can do different things with him. Uh, I don't understand how we've got to a point where suddenly he's being used differently to what was expected. Like it's a safety, like they play cover three, they play, they play cover four. The safety has to line up on the field in a certain position. They blitzed in plenty in 2020, maybe 2020 when it went or went wrong a bit. 2022, they were, had a really interesting plan. It looked like for him. And then he got hurt, unfortunately on a play where he was blitzing. Right. Yep. I, I just, yeah. It, so to me, it comes off like front office description of, oh, maybe we were a bit surprised in 2021 that he was playing as a safety uh, when we wanted him in a linebacker role because how would you explain that to someone? Well, kind of how I've explained it to someone of they're lining up in what would technically be a linebacker position uh, in layman's terms, but it's in the defense is safety and they're in the box, right? Yeah, I, I'm just rambling right now, but no, it's, just, no, no, it's you... kind of a crazy... Uh, you, you set me off there because I, I don't understand... Like that box safeties have been a thing in the NFL for, for quite some time. Um, and we saw, you know, a guy who could do a bit of that and a bit of the high stuff and a bit of the, the edge stuff, just like we saw with Cam Chancellor who did it in a very different way. Like <laughs> why can't, why yeah. do people forget what Cam Chancellor did? I don't, well, I don't understand. I, 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 you, you touched on a couple of things that I want to, I want to stay with here for a moment. One is that, I think when most people think of Cam Chancellor, they think of this fearsome hitter, right? Mm -hmm. Scariest secondary player probably in the NFL, probably that the NFL has seen in a mm -hmm. long time. And I think that that sort of undersells, to your point, what exactly Cam Chancellor did. It's kind of like just saying Ken Griffey Jr. hit home runs. It's like, well... Ken Griffey Jr. also hit for a high average and played gold glove center field and did so many different things. I mean, Cam Chancellor is my favorite Seahawk of all time. And, mm -hmm. and I'm glad that you mentioned his versatility. He played so many different positions within his own position and created so many opportunities for Seattle's defensive play calling because you could ask him to do so much. Very similar to what we've seen from Kyle Hamilton, different play style, but similar versatility. And, yep. and it opens up so much when you have a player like that. And Jamal Adams is not Cam Chancellor. I don't know that anyone in the modern NFL is. But, and and I, I am a noted J Jamal Adams defender. I mean, was he ever going to make an impact that justified the trade cost for him? That that's a tough ask. And then he had some really brutal injuries, some of which he played through. I mean, he played with one arm for an entire season and, and, you know, he, he hasn't helped himself out from a PR standpoint uh, at certain times too. But the thing about Jamal Adams that I appreciated, and that is going to be difficult to replace for everyone that's happy that he's gone out there. Look, I get it, but there's things that that position is asked to do that doesn't show up in the box score. And part of that is setting the edge on defense. It's taking on a pulling guard, a 320 pounder with a running start. And you need to go take away his outside shoulder. And the only way you do that is hitting that dude as hard as you can. Cam Chancellor was obviously incredible at it. He had some highlights of knocking pulling guards on their asses, but Jamal Adams was willing to do that. And I think Mike, you can maybe uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we were talking with uh, Michael Sean Dugar 
And he mentioned about when Jamal Adams got hurt, Ryan Neal was asked to do that. And, and Ryan Neal was very game for it. But he talked about how much that job sucks. Just coming up and your job is to just get creamed essentially by a pulling guard or uh, a tackle that's not engaged on a run play. And that that's just a pure mentality play, right? Either you're willing to do that over and over again or you're not. And Jamal Adams, for whatever his shortcomings were, was very willing to do that and very capable in a lot of other areas. But he is gone now, and so is Quandre Diggs. And Quandre Diggs is another one of those real locker room leader guys. And, you know, I'd like to believe the door is open for one or both of those guys to come back. But as of right now, they're not on the roster. And they did bring in someone named Rayshon Jenkins, who's a bit of an analytical darling. Talk to us a little bit about him and and how you see his fit in Seattle. Yeah, that's interesting, uh, Jenkins being an analytical darling. Um, I, I, I'm I familiar with that too. And it kind of gave me pause because I was like, huh? Okay. I think he's just like a solid, a solid player. Um, and I think just looking at the Jacksonville reception to him as well, it's like he'll, he'll have some really good moments. And then there's a moment where you're like, huh, that was really bad. Um, well, and that's, and that's why I want to get your, your film take on it. Because when I say analytical darling, it's like, you know, this is a top three guy in completion percentage over expectation when the ball is thrown his way, that, that kind of thing. And I really do like stats like that because they help add color to the picture, but they are not in and of themselves, the whole picture. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like I remember watching him, he's playing in a deep quarter. He's driving on an in cut, which is always a good kind of indicator of, um, well, a lot of safety play, but I imagine he'll be playing in a lot of kind of, well, not a lot of, but a fair amount of split safety looks. And you you want to see how they, they'll be able to do that. And he drives down on it really well. And you're like, oh, here comes a massive hit. And he just completely whiffs on, on the guy. It's like controller died type play. Hmm. And that's kind of what I'm speaking to of. I think he'll he'll be really solid and he'll make some really good plays. And then there'll just be that, there'll be like the odd moment, which... I think it's probably the di- reason why he's not the top, you know, top of the safety uh, deal. And I think it's the reason why he is in that kind of, I don't know what tier he is. I'm not good with contracts. Tier three, tier two, tier three. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. He's, he's um, certainly not going to show up on any list of the highest paid yeah. safeties. And, and oftentimes players who do show up on that are recent free agency signings <laughs> like him, but, but he did yeah. not command that type of contract right. to, to your point. How do you feel a player with his skill set, his strengths and his weaknesses yeah. fits alongside Julian love. Who's a player that Mike and I went back and forth on a lot last year and who I will admit struggled early on, but I thought played really well back half of the season. Do you see them as complementary skill sets or a little bit superfluous with each other? Ah, there you go. Julian love with the all pro vote, right? There you go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I'm not saying I would have voted him all pro. Uh, yeah, I think complimentary is a good word for them. Uh, I think j- like watching Jenkins, he he, he d- did a bit of everything for them. He's but he's more kind of a guy you want in. Um, you don't want him to play like a deep half necessarily, or he didn't play a deep half necessarily. So a bit more space, you're like you're covering a whole deep half of the field. Uh, you want him kind of tighter, uh, more kind of near the hash playing a, a deep kind of quarter. So only a quarter of the field, not a ha- whole half of the field. So he's, he's um, not super rangy and, is what you're saying. No, I think, you know, he has some range, but it's more, you know, he's got a bit more size and he has um, just kind of the movement skills, which uh, translate more to that, 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 that uh, space. But it's not like a necessarily a, a complete lack of range, but, you know, Quandre Diggs was a type of safety you'd play, play in a deep half, um, and I think Julian Love is probably kind of a more of a deep half guy than Jenkins. So I think they're, they're fairly interchangeable. And again, that's fascinating to me because when you combine that with Kayvon Wallace, who's kind of a less glitzy signing, even Kobe Bryant, who was playing some strong safety in the preseason, like I think they can do a bit of everything. And as long as you're doing them with a bit of everything, and obviously then there's some disguise to that and there's some multiplicity, then I don't think they'll ever be like massively exposed. Like I think they'll they'll be fine. They'll be able to do it. 
I think when you start really trying to do like get really good with them at one thing, that's when they kind of lose some of their well, some of their level of play. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if like Julian Love could play occasionally down in the slot. So could Rachel Jenkins. Kayvon Wallace did that in, uh, with the Titans as well. Kobe Bryant obviously was a nickel in 2022. All of those guys can play some deep stuff, right? And then they all feel to me, because they're kind of more strong safety type bodies-ish, um, but they're more kind of quarter players in less space, um, you know, more to the short side. So you've got all these types of... Uh, yeah, they're kind of interchangeable. So how does that look on the field? Do we see three of them out? Uh, probably, right? But do we see four of them out on the field? Hmm. And and how how, uh, how how does that all construct itself? One thing that is very kind of, well, it used to be trendy. It might be beyond the trend at this point, but everyone's heard of, everyone's heard, and then I'm going to say something which could be quite niche to some people. But anyway, in certain circles, everyone was talking about Iowa State and how they played three high, a three high look, right? Now, McDonald caused Seattle loads of problems when uh, they visited Baltimore last season with like three high looks. Idea being you're showing a three high shell from the safeties on the back end. You've got the corners pressed up on the outside. And then, well, we could just play three deep safeties. We could spin one of them down, play cover two. We could spin two of them down, play cover three, cover one. We could spin all three of them down. We could do all sorts of rotations of that because of a three high shell, you can, it, you've got the numbers to do a lot of different things uh, deep and and then under, uh, a lot of different ways you can rotate into the underneath at the same time because you've got a guy in the middle, you've got a guy on the right, you've got a guy on the left all back there so they can all do different things. And I think with the skill sets that they have right now, they would benefit from that type of disguise, but they also have the ability to kind of do a bit of each of those roles. But you don't want them doing too much of one role. Uh, so th I'm disappointed that Conde Diggs has left because I think he was a, a very talented safety. Obviously, the Jamal Adams thing is tragic from an injury perspective, and he didn't look like his usual self health-wise. You could tell he was suffering from pain. But the safety group now, knowing what McDonald's going to want to do uh, in some ways, but then also thinking he's going to evolve and fit. He, his strength in Baltimore was adapting to his personnel. Well, what does it look like with this personnel? That, that is fascinating to me. There's no Carl Hamilton out of this group. There is uh, Devin Witherspoon, of course. But um, in terms of the safety group, there's no clear star to me. But there is a number of role players who could uh, uh, do something and be deployed in an interesting way. You know, I, I think during the Legion of Boom era, you just you knew who was going to be on the field and it was a pretty simplistic defense and you knew kind of what their roles would be. Obviously there's a lot of nuance within that, but you could count on the same guys. It feels like it's going to be a little bit more mix and match on defense this year, which I don't hate in the hands of a guy like, you know, Mike McDonald, just given his track record. But of course he's going to be balancing that with his new responsibilities as head coach and de facto CEO. As I always say, head coach, you're the de facto CEO of a fortune 500 company. I mean, you have a lot of other responsibilities and I'll be curious to see how it affects his role as defensive coordinator. Um, you know, cause he, he was very open in his opening press conference about how he is still the defensive coordinator until basically someone proves that they can take that job from him. There is one more move that I want to talk to you about before we get to the draft. And it wasn't a free agency signing, but it was a pre-draft move. And that was the trade for Sam Howell and the release of Drew Locke. Last year, 67 different quarterbacks started games in the NFL, which is the most ever. It broke the record from 2022, which was 62 different quarterbacks starting the NFL. We have seen this offseason, both through the draft and free agency, how the NFL is starting to reprioritize a backup quarterback. When you look at what we saw from Drew Locke in his time in Seattle and even in Denver before that, and you compare it to what we've seen from Sam Howell in Washington, is this an upgrade? And was the trade worth it? Hmm. Because chances yeah, are he's going to start some games. Yeah. Yeah, there there are there are some chances of that. You're right, and I, I good for Drew Lock going to actually sounds like he's going to have a real shot to go be the starter there. So good for him, and they're trying not to get fired. So 
Right. Good luck with that. Uh, anyway, Sam Howell. Huh. The the trade is hard to evaluate the trade without thinking of Seattle not having that second round pick because of Leonard Williams. So then it's like at the time, oh my gosh, you have really got like your draft assets are so rough. Uh, we're going to talk about the draft, but they they seem to do okay with that, all things considered. Um, yeah. But yeah, at the time I was like, oh, I get it, but really like backup quarterback and that's to your point, Jackson of. Uh, you know, the importance of a backup quarterback in the league and the the NFL perhaps, you know, uh, re- well, not extra kind of diving into that, doubling down on, on that. Um, and yeah, I don't know. He's, I don't, he can extend plays. He can kind of be vibey in the way that uh, Drew Locke was, I think, you know, for a game or two with his experience, you know, learning a system, not dropping back like a hundred times a game almost. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe right. he can... Uh, he can do some things. He's, uh, you know, tough and he he can throw a football. Uh, it's always important from the quarterback position. But the picks and the sacks are crazy. And I do wonder, like, you know, not that Mike McDonald is is uh, not going to have a say, but with uh, if Pete Carroll had still been in the building, how much more of a deal would, you know, 21 interceptions have been and the, the turnovers compared mm-hmm. to McDonald, who obviously has a say, but he ain't the president of football operations and he's not yet been shouting, it's all about the ball. Right. You never want to turn the ball over on on offense, uh, obviously, but it was obviously such, a, such an important emphasis. And if you look at like, so, <laughs> you inevitably got um, John Schneider's other quarterbacks and <laughs> you look at like Brett Favre and um, his history with him and maybe he's kind of more okay with guys who've turned the ball over a bit and but they, they were young and the, the idea that maybe they can learn from it. But yeah, I, I mean, it's, in, it's interesting. Can't wait to see what uh, Ryan Grubb does with him. It's going to be a big preseason and... Yeah, he's a, he's a fun player, but I I prefer Drew Lock absolutely. I you do Drew okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. We talk about this on the show fairly often. You know, a, a lot of people want the backup quarterback to be able to come in and Nick Foles their way to a championship, right? And that look, you you get a, a season like that, or the Case Keenum season where I think they won like fourteen games or whatever with him mm-hmm. in Minnesota. Those are outliers. Those are not realistic expectations for a backup. What I look at is. If you have a competitive team and your starter goes down for a month, your starter goes down for the season, your year is probably fucked. But if your starter goes down for a month and you're competitive, is your backup good enough to go 500? Can they go two and two and keep the season on the rails? And I Mm. I think Drew Locke, to me, represented sort of like the the definition of that cutoff. Like, yes, with a with a competitive team he's good enough to go two and two if you need him to Mm -hmm. it's it's tough to evaluate sam howell one because of the insane pass rate that washington ran with him i mean the the sheer volume of dropbacks that he had is going to invite a lot of sacks and a lot of turnovers A, a, a player being more inclined to turn the ball over is only a big deal if his strengths aren't enough to overcome that You know, oftentimes you see some of the better quarterbacks in the NFL have high turnover seasons, but it's because they're taking gambles and they're talented enough to win more of those gambles than lose. Sam Howell is a gambler. There is no question about that. He is a gambler. Do you think the juice is worth the squeeze with him? Yeah, you know, he obviously has some talent. It's just... Yeah, just the the amount of risks and the kind of extent trying to extend plays into stuff. Well, extending plays into you know interceptions and and, and sacks and and negative plays rather than kind of just quitting on a play, which obviously is amplified by the the high pass volume as you said. But I, I it, it almost feel yeah, it, it's not the steady veteran type player that you would want to come in. Um, right. And and you're and not bringing like, in Jacoby hey, Brissett. Don't, don't f this up, right? But then yeah. I didn't think Drew Locke was like that either. And then he'd uh, break the pocket and yeet the ball down the field, and <laughs> there was uh, no fan, and they'd be like, "Oh my gosh, what is happening here?" Um, so so maybe maybe how that I, mean, I think that's probably the vision of how like he can you, you, obviously you're going to run the football a bit more, you're going to kind of keep the training wheels on him a bit more, 
And you know that if he needs to make a play, he could make one or two plays. He has the talent to do that. If we're getting into, hey, we need this guy to put like f- make five or six of his plays, that's not that's just going to be a complete catastrophe. Um, and you know, maybe he can get, maybe he can, uh, you know, he'll have learned from Washington and a different environment, change of scene, all that good stuff. Learning from Geno Smith, which. Say what you want about Geno Smith, even without the talent. Geno's been around a lot of different teams, a lot of different locker rooms. Learned some pretty important lessons himself, right, about that sort of stuff. So I think Geno Smith's mentorship in terms of that is a, is an underrated aspect to the acquisition as well. Yeah, right. I, I mean, and the starting quarterback does have an impact on the development of of a backup quarterback. And, and I think Sam Howell, you know, again, he was someone that was incredibly highly touted coming out of high school. And there was a time early in his collegiate career where he was seen as a high end first round pick. And those traits are clearly there. The NFL game, of course, just demands so many different things than a typical college offense and typical college opponents require of you. And, and that's what makes quarterback the most valuable position in American sports. Look, I want to I want to transition into the draft here. A lot has been said about the Seahawks first couple of picks, but we haven't dived too deep on their day 3 guys, and I am excited to learn more about them from you. But first, I do want to get your opinion on how Seattle approached the first 2 days. Give me your immediate reaction when Seattle drafted Byron Murphy at 16, and then I want to talk to you about Christian Haynes after that. Well, the firstly, interesting that they weren't trading down. That was my thing. I was like, cool, fair enough. And then that was not really a thing in the first half of the draft this year. Right, right. And then it was like, oh my gosh, they the, that's the fourteenth offensive player. Uh, and then Latu went, and I was like, oh, I don't even know if Seattle would have drafted him. And then mm-hmm. it was like, oh, they have the pick of anyone. This is incredible for the second in, year running somehow. In fact, they per get John take, Boyle, Latu was not even on right. their board because of the the injury history. Exactly. And so for the second year running, they get to take the second defensive player in the draft. And this year it's their defensive player one, which is nuts. Uh, you, yeah. It's one of those things as well where you, you looked at it uh, on like the mock draft simulators or or you know, all that shenanigans. And you're like, oh, it could happen, but probably not, right? Like, there's no way, there's no way they can just wait this out. And obviously the lack of draft assets, they had no choice but to wait it out. Um, and then, yeah, it was, I, I like Johnny Newton as a player. Obviously the, you know, you anticipated medical stuff might be a thing coming into it. Uh, I also liked Byron Murphy. I think his potential in the NFL is really, really exciting because in college he's playing mainly as a nose tackle and, you know, there's reasons they do that. He's really good as a nose tackle, uh, playing on the inside shoulder of a guard, kind of two-gapping quite a bit, which, by the way, McDonald does with his noses. But in the NFL, he's under 300 pounds and you will get comboed as a nose tackle. And though Murphy can deal with combos occasionally, it's obvious that, you know, his explosiveness, his first step... um, is designed to be more as a three tech on the outside shoulder of the guard, that interior pass rusher. And at Texas, he didn't do actually as much of that as you'd think at all. Hmm. Not, not only that, he didn't really play with the technique that you'd use uh, in, in those situations. And that McDonald will be coaching and uh, Adam Dirty will be coaching these guys uh, on the interior of the line. So then it's like, oh my, this guy's kind of untapped. Like what he could be is untapped. Like year one, maybe he's looking you know, kind of role player, gives some pass rush juice, contributes. uh, Maybe that's what it is. But year three, this, you know, he could be damn good. Like really, really good. Uh, So you like the pick? Oh, yeah. (laughs) And that's all to say. (laughs) The pick was right. Yeah. No, I like the pick. Yeah. I think it was kind of a, when Newton falls with the the medical thing, I understand the conversation around going for corner. There'd been talk of that heating up, but like, come on now, let's, I'm sick of uh, everyone. Sick of the trenches being a a thing in Seattle, like a, a kind of a problem point. I mean, ha- ha- think about it. If you're a, a offensive coordinator, who are you game planning for right now? Like Leonard Williams. Uh, you stick Murphy on the field. Um, Jaron Reed had some pass rush juice, but um, Murphy and Williams. That's a tough decision. Like you, you, you have to leave someone one on one. Yeah, and 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 it goes back to you know so much being made about Seattle not having a second round pick in in this year's draft and you know i I suppose the answer to that is yes they did it's just it's leonard williams they essentially Mm -hmm. drafted a 28 year old and paid him a a second contract 
you know, there it's more expensive and he's older, but you also have far more of a sure thing than whoever you were going to be picking in the fifties. Do you see Murphy and Williams as having overlapping skill sets, or are these two guys you can put on the field at the same time and, and really force that decision from an offense that you're talking about? Well, a passing downs, absolutely. You can put them on the field at the same time, right? Cause that's just this time where you can like uh, d- defense coordinators can play with their food, right? They can, uh, they can put all their, the best, the best four or best five pass rushes out there and, and, and let them work that out. But, and I think that's where McDonald has excelled. Right. Right. Absolutely. And arguably with less interior pass rush talent than he has in Seattle right now. Um, obviously, he might have been a heck of a player, but just the the combination of guys Seattle's assembled is is intriguing. So early downs, I think Leonard Williams can play basic. Well, it depends what type of defense you're looking for, right? In base, like three four, which McDonald only used twenty one percent of the time um, in 2023. Absolutely, they can they can play together. Um, Williams would be more the like the two gapping end, and then you'd you'd work away for for Murphy to play more to three, but that's only twenty one percent of the snaps, right? So the other seventy nine percent nailed it. Um, <laughs> the other seventy nine percent of the snaps, uh, and then let's let's get rid of the passing downs where we're playing with our food. You're going to be in a nickel front. It's going to be very similar to what we saw in twenty twenty two Seattle, where the nose is going to be more of a two gapping type. He's going to be inside shoulder to guard. Then you've got the three tech. And I think, as I said, Murphy can do some of the nose stuff. He can do some of that two gapping stuff. Williams can do some of that too, but he's more stouter. He's like a throwback prototypical three technique, big, strong presence in the, in the B gap. Whereas Murphy's just this kind of almost the new breed of three tech where he's just this explosive kind of a, you know, undersized, whatever you want to call it guy. But, um, yeah, the, you could almost plug and play them. Like the Ravens last year, obviously, um, Michael Pierce was their their like main uh, like prototypical nose. Like he's he's over three hundred fifty pounds. <laughs> but if you when he wasn't on the field, right, and he played over fifty percent of the snaps when he wasn't on the field, it was Broderick Washington and Travis Jones, and they kind of plug and played them, meaning. One played on the left, one played on the right. If I need to be a nose tackle on this play, I'm going to play the nose. If I'm if I'm on the right uh, and we we get the strength that way, okay, I'm going to be a three technique. Um, so they basically play both. And I think that interchangeability is something that applies. Now, if uh, Murphy is struggling uh, or teams start targeting, you know, him in a combination block type thing, there's obviously, you know, you could you could get him off that role for a bit. You can mm-hmm. just play your bigger nose tackles, which there's kind of a backlog there right now in terms of the guys who could hold up every time at nose tackle. They don't mm-hmm. have a 350 plus pounder, but there's there's a number of guys there. Uh, but yeah, Murphy could do it in in spots, absolutely. You know, after the Murphy pick, Seattle had to wait a really long time, 65 mm-hmm. picks before they made another selection. And Christian Haynes is someone that was on my hope list, but I thought he'd be gone guard out of Yukon and someone who profiles really well as a pass defender. And when I look at Seattle's guard picks in the draft over the last, honestly, however far you want to go back, so many of them, if not all of them, their strength in their scouting profile was their ability to win in the run game. And there's been mixed results in that in, in Seattle with those guys they have struggled in pass protection. Pressure up the middle has been a massive thorn in Seattle side for a long time. What I liked about Haynes is his ability to set up and not give ground in pass protection. Do you get the same read from that guy? And were you similarly surprised to still see him there at 81? Yeah, absolutely the same read. I mean, he, his ability to stay square, not get turned, uh, his feet. I mean, Griff and I watched him on a stream the other day and we were very impressed just watching it back. I um, We watched him against Tennessee because obviously coming out of UConn, you have the uh, level of competition faced concern, but, you know, up against an SEC opponent, uh, really, really solid, looked completely polished at basically everything. Uh, run game, pass game, UConn's run game as well. They do a bit of everything, bit of gap, bit of uh, zone concepts, which I believe uh, Scott Huff, Ryan Grubb will want to do in Seattle. And then, 
just really explosive type of athlete getting out in space. You know, I think uh, relative athletic score, I think he was a 9.1, uh, which means he's athletic. Yep. Um, <laughs> he's, uh, he's uh, yeah, just a, a really polished player. And I just, I you know, it's kind of the unique nature of the draft where you get all of those tackles going in the first round. Then suddenly it's like, okay, well, there's some defensive players left, so we'll take the defensive players. And then one of them's, uh, you know, certainly in the second round, and then one of them just falls. I guess he's older, but for me, the main concern would have been, I get what level of comp, right, which I've just talked about, and at the senior bowl, by the way, uh, especially playing the right guard, almost flawless, like really, really impressive senior bowl too. Um, not, just a nasty finisher as well. Uh, and then the other concern, just being a sixth year super senior, uh, so he's, he is old and all of his career starts, 49 starts were at that right guard spot, I think. So, you know, he doesn't have that. In in the past, you mentioned what Seattle's looked for. They also like that versatility, right? It's always an added bonus. And he did play some left guard and center the senior bowl. Center's probably not for him. Uh, a bit too high, but left guard, um, he looked He okay. is a top heavy dude, isn't he? He is top heavy, but like, but then you know he he seems he he does all right with it, you know. He's yep. uh, yeah, he, he knows does right his body, it. and and I think that we tend to have too narrow a view of athleticism. And I think at the end of the day, athleticism comes down to how well can you use your body with the strengths that it has. And I think that he's really good at that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that speaks to his, you know, ability to uh, finish as well. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, you're going to have to be able to do that too. I mean, we've we've seen that a couple of years ago. You know, we saw Ken Walker and Rashad Penny just ripping off the first half of the season, unbelievable efficiency, right? I mean, these are two guys who are averaging over five yards per carry, who are at the very top in breakaway run percentage. And then you get some injuries on the interior offensive line. And they went from averaging over two yards before contact to averaging negative yards <laughs> before contact. And of course, you know, you look at, at the box score and you say, oh, you know, the running backs have fallen off, but really it's the interior line's ability to win that first step that creates so much of that opportunity. So even though he's really good, at pass blocking or at least profiles to be really good at pass blocking it is still important to be able to win when your first step is forward as opposed to your first step being backwards when friday of draft week was over and you're looking at it and you're starting to look forward to saturday and, and, and day three what kind of grade did you give seattle for the first two days of the draft i think well there is historical um proof of this so I might, I might i might get corrected by someone who's like no i watched your stream you gave them this but i think i gave them a, a b plus it might have been an a mm -hmm. you know like mm -hmm. for how they did without trades now obviously it helps to be lucky right they, they got a bit of luck but for Absolutely. how they did with no trades i think they did about as good as you could do um and just just looking at how the draft shook out where players were graded where you know what how they how it fell i think they did pretty damn good yeah you know the draft it feels like things set up really well for seattle over the last couple of drafts in that they addressed perimeter positions with corner and wide receiver uh running back tackle right those mm -hmm. those were positions that they hammered over the last couple of drafts and then all of a sudden you have a draft class that's absolutely loaded those positions aside from running back and so to your point, you saw tackles and wide receivers and quarterbacks being pushed way, way up this year. And Seattle wasn't in desperate need of any of those positions. Now, I, I believe early in the draft, I'm more of a best player available type of guy and, and look for need later. It just so happened that at both Seattle's picks, in my opinion, the best player available were at positions of need. And that is so helpful because as fans, we do want to look at the holes in the boat and say, can we plug them? And it feels like Seattle plugged them. But then you get into day three and it is about value. Now you start to look and say, okay, who is available? Who can really help shore up some of these positions? And Seattle got busy here. You know, they ended up with the following assortment of players. Mike, you want to read off those names? Sure. Uh, we got Tyrese Knight, linebacker out of UTEP, AJ Barner, tight end out of Michigan, Nehemiah Pritchett, corner out of Auburn, Satawa Lamea, 
a guard out of Utah, DJ James, the other corner out of Auburn, and then Michael Jarrell, tackle out of Findlay. Maddie, when first of all, which of those guys, if any, did you have circled going into the draft? Because I know you and Griff go real deep. And and which of those players were you just like, yes, glad they got him. If any of those guys fit that criteria. Well, uh, uh, just continuing from what you're saying, the it was I found it nice that there are other positions of need, right? Are generally less lower drafted positions, right? Like tight end, linebacker, the, the stuff you thought, hey, they should probably come away uh, from the draft with one of these positions. You're like, okay, day three wise, um, that that kind of syncs up quite nicely, and and so it proved in that they got their best linebacker from Dave three in their eyes. Um, they got the pick of the tight ends almost. I know um, Tip Ryman went, but I mean AJ Barner was someone I wondered out about before because um, uh, before the draft, as you asked, because he went to Michigan and so did uh, Mike McDonald. But no, um, he also <laughs> right. uh, you know he's Jay Harbour link with the special team stuff, which came out. Um, after the draft, they're speaking about how he contributed in all of the special teams of Harbour, uh, the, the new Seahawks special teams coach, of course. And kind of they needed that more prototypical inline type guy. Noah Fan, honestly, you don't really want him in line too much. Right. You want to move him around. You want to keep him away from contact uh, at the line of scrimmage. And you want to accent what his uh, strengths are. So Barna really, that pick, and obviously they... Uh, they, <laughs> as we covered before we came on air, Pharaoh Brown uh, was also a free agent signing uh, right. to give you like a pure blocking type of Will Disley gone. Um, so Bar- Barna made sense in that respect to me of like kind of a do it all, the type of tight end the Big Ten always churns out. But, you know, coming from Michigan where they ran the ball a heck of a lot. And then as a receiver, they didn't pass the ball much. But as a receiver, he has some wiggle in the open field. Uh, his um, roots are pretty crisp. I think he's kind of you know, the best of him as a receiver could still come. So it's just like a solid uh, pick where he'll be fine not playing loads of snaps, but when you need him to come in, he can do a bit of everything for you, which is exactly what they needed from the tight end, uh, along with the special teams impact. You know, uh, yeah, I, I think A.J. Barner fits a role, and, and he's unlikely to be the type of player just because of the role that he's likely to play is mostly an inline tight end. He's not going to be a fantasy <laughs> superstar, anything like that. But there are niche roles in the NFL that are necessary to help your team win. And he seems to profile as the type of guy who can help out in both the run and the pass game in a way that shows up in other players' statistical output, right? Where he's not going to be credited in the box score for what he did, but he does those things really well. A player that I thought was really interesting was Seattle's first day three pick is Tyrese Knight. He's linebacker from UTEP, like Mike said. And I know that tackles can be a bit of an empty calorie stat because oftentimes mm-hmm. it's, it just comes down to opportunities. And if your defense is on the field a lot, like we've seen with uh, Bobby Wagner and Jordan Brooks being you know, at, at the top of the tackles leaderboard, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're playing great defense. But Tyrese Knight led all of FBS in solo tackles. Is that something that you look at and say, hell yeah? Or is that like, well, he was just the best player on a defense that wasn't so great? No, of course you've got, that's that's like the main sell of him. Like he can run, he can hit, he can tackle. Like to tackle, there's a lot that goes into that. There's the running, uh, there's the finding the football, like so play diagnosis. And then there is the hitting, like how are you going to take that guy down and actually register the tackle and to do that as a linebacker is is impressive now uh it's also cool that this is mcdonald's like guy like the uh john schneider deferred to mcdonald as the linebacker guru and mcdonald mentioned all the things you'd expect the kind of density playing square uh, reading the play all that type of stuff and mcdonald knows his linebackers right so that's that's great um now <laughs> Watching watching nights, uh, I I didn't quite see it the same way as uh, the much more uh, smarter and highly paid um, for that Mike McDonald did. Uh, he is a very high cut player. He struggles to sink, and then he's also making a lot of his tackles. What what that means is a lot of his tackles are kind of grabbing around the helmet of a player, which is a quick way to break your arm. I mean, hopefully that doesn't happen, but it's kind of, of dangerous and also in the NFL is not going to be as effective. Uh, there's the level of comp thing with him coming 
from UTEP. Didn't stand out to me. The senior bowl looked very kind of rusty movement wise. So I coverage, I'm unsure he can do any of the Mike linebacker stuff, even though, or the advanced Mike linebacker stuff, I really don't think is his game, even though his density, playing square, getting downhill, north south type player inside the tackle uh, is more of a Mike type, right? Uh, I know they said they're going to start him at will, try and play him in both. And then also, a lot of his tackles are coming three yards from the line of scrimmage, where that's just the scheme UTEP are playing. But it obviously gets him closer to the football. And yeah, he diagnoses some plays correctly, but then there's other times he guesses and he's wrong. So I just I just uh, didn't see that the same way as as uh, as McDonald and, and Schneider. I liked in, in the uh, day three range, I liked uh, Jordan McGee, which again, I'm adapting to what they see from linebackers too. But McGee to me, he's a, more of a will type, right? But he could run and hit and find the football and do the coverage stuff. And uh, Knight can kind of run. Uh, he hits, but I I um, I think there is some flaws to that approach uh, the, and the tackling approach. And he, yeah, the coverage, yeah, as I said. So I just good. It'll be I I could be wrong. Does he profile to you as an NFL starter? No. Okay. Absolutely not. Fair. But and I, I mean, we're talking about day three. <laughs> Yeah, we are talking about day three. We are talking about day three, and That's right. yeah, we'll we'll see. Um, yeah, I just uh, that was um, that was one of those where I wanted to watch the tape back and be like, okay, you know what? Let me let me revisit this. Let me dive in. And then when I revisited it, and I'm hearing some of the things which are being said, and I'm watching something which is completely contradicting that, I'm like, okay, this is this is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> You know, there's there's four other uh, players besides Barner and Knight mm-hmm. that Seattle drafted. And I'm going to put them into a couple of buckets. And we had two corners, both from Auburn, Nehemiah mm-hmm. Pritchett, DJ James. Do you see with these guys, we, we talked earlier about how there is the potential that maybe Seattle would consider a corner in the first round. And you had some really high-end cornerback talent this mm-hmm. year. Um, I think most people would look at Seattle's roster and say corner is one of the strengths of this team, if not the strength of the team from a personnel standpoint. Hmm. It's still a position in the NFL that requires a lot of depth, especially in the modern NFL. Hmm. What do you see from these Auburn corners, and do they feel like good picks given the low cost of acquisition? Hey, that this is a fun story, actually, uh, because I was watching Pritchett, or I thought I was watching Pritchett at the Senior Bowl, so I like, put because I had a cut up of um, uh, the DB stuff. Don't ask me how. And so I, I put on uh, <laughs> put on what I thought was Pritchett Auburn helmet. I'm like, he looks kind of small. It's like, oh, this guy's You're on got the dark some, web this- trading crypto for, <laughs> for for bootlegged senior bowl cornerback reps. I get yeah, you. I'm going to go, uh, what do you guys say? Plead the fifth. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I put on this guy and I'm like, oh, he's wearing an Auburn helmet. He looks kind of small, but that's Pritchett, right? And, and I'm like, oh, that that's really cool technique. Uh, had this moment on stream. I was like, that's really cool technique. And I'm like, oh, that's not number one, which is Pritchett's number, the senior ball. That's number four. It's like, ah, oh, number four looked nice. Pritchett's got some movement skills, but technique-wise, eh, it's, it's a work in progress. The former wide receiver background shows up. He played a lot of right corner at the senior bowl, which... By the way, Reek Woolen's position, you think about Pritchett's movement skills, kind of a Reek Woolen light, but with high level of competition, a lot of man-to-man reps. He, he diagnoses roots well. He just needs to be taught, I think, like uh, an NFL-style type of uh, press man technique, which I'm excited to see. Anyway, then then they pick another Auburn corner. I'm like, that will be number four from the Senior Bowl. And it's it's DJ James. And I'm like, oh my gosh. this So this DJ James is is exciting now you're the you're the second person we've had on this show to highlight dj james there you go he's he's very light okay so let's let's get over that he's small okay great brilliant but his movement skills and he ran a seven two second three cone which i mean i'm skeptical about the three cone anyway but i just like throw it out after that because the senior ball his movement skills stream nickel corner to me like he is Mm -hmm. agile his ability to break on like you know he's inside leverage off man and he's like all over a a deep comeback uh route which is a a difficult very difficult skill going for the undercut um unreal type of movement skills and i really like him impressed like he 
He can unlock his hip on an outside release with how he steps with it. He's a very, very intriguing player to me and someone who, if you look at McDonald's background in, with the Ravens, you're thinking, how does DJ James fit into this? Well, Witherspoon can play in the slot as your kind of nickel corner, right? Absolutely. But McDonald also had, obviously, Carl Hamilton, who played in the slot. But then finally, he had Arthur Millette. And Millette was a five foot nine, or, or is a five foot nine. He is he is still an NFL player and still with us. Good. Um, he's five foot nine. He's small. Um, he's that kind of throwback, pure nickel type corner. And for me, that's what James is in this defense. And I think the only issue he has, and it showed up a big time at the senior bowl as well, is his uh, ball skills. Like there was times where he was in the position. It's like, okay, now we can undercut that and run that back to the the the, uh, the other end zone. That's a pick six. Or even in the the DB individual drills, he's dropping the ball or. or um, yeah, just not just bad ball skills. So, can he learn that? We'll see. That could be the problem. I think there's two big questions. There's, every team has more than two big questions. I think two of the biggest questions for Seattle comes down to who is Abe Lucas moving forward at tackle after a brilliant rookie season, and then obviously the injury that. <laughs> I think there's a case to be made that Abe Lucas was one of the most impactful Seahawks in the last two years. And then you also have Reek Woolen, who almost won defensive rookie of the year and then also struggled with some injuries last year, but really regressed from a play standpoint. Do you think that either of these corners can take snaps away from Reek Woolen? Like how fragile do you see that position being? Or are these guys just, just depth that you rotate in and then you hope they become something more? Yeah, well, so James, no, because they're just not going to be in the same position, okay? I, I just don't think that's a thing. But I, I do think there's a path to playing time. You know, you want someone who can play man coverage on these, you know, play matchups in the slot with the more nimble guys there. I think James can do a bit of that. He's like a role player. That's his his role. Now, Pritchett, uh, m- most possibly, <laughs> most probably, uh, in, in the... <sighs> Woolen is a, in a massive third year like absolutely yes. massive La- uh, first year great brilliant looked there was some technique things we need to polish up second year unfortunate injury isn't able to refine the technique stuff that we needed to get done so kind of struggles in that aspect and then gets benched right the tackling is a, in a bigger issue which by the way in college there was some plays which uh, i mean i tweeted out a video of them it's like why isn't he putting his body on the, on the line here? Why isn't he making the tackle? And then, you know, there's some other things that maybe behind the scenes he he uh, maybe wasn't uh, being a, a pro, right, in terms of his application uh, with the Seahawks. Mm-hmm. And so this third year, new regime, well, suddenly it's kind of, I mean, he, it, <laughs> the starting spot's not, I think, as secure as people would think, especially yeah. from a national perspective. When they look at the Seahawks, they're like, oh, I know Reek Wool, and he, he had a great rookie year. What a, what a story, pro bowler, et cetera, et cetera. But you look at it now, I think he's on very shaky ground. Um, hmm. Trey Brown's going to be battling. He's in a contract year. He has experience on the right side, even though he's a left-sided guy. Mike Jackson's uh, re-signed to an even uh, cheaper contract than his tender, albeit with a bit more guaranteed money. He's going to be battling out right corner. And this Pritchett, as I said... All of those snaps in the senior ball on the right side uh, and just the the way that he was playing some of the red zone drills in particular. So they go red zone one-on-one, so less space, but then also less of a root tree, especially at the senior ball. And he's he's not, he's not just kind of get no, diagnosing what route the guy is running. And it's not something which necessarily you can do every rep in the NFL in the open field when it's not a one-on-one, it's a game. But in that format... It, he, it's a cheat code and he's just w- running the route for the receiver every single time. And it's like, that was like how Reek Willem was playing at the senior bowl. You know, you watched him and you were like, okay, this guy is like, he's a very impressive athlete, but you don't really, like the technique, we can do a lot of work with here, but that is very impressive that he's just run that route for that guy. And and Pritch is that, but a kind of SEC, slightly less athletic sure. um, type of dude. So yeah, Willem's spot is, um, that's, uh, big time thing I'm paying attention to uh, when the beat reporters report from training cramp and they're saying how, how Willen's doing and something to monitor for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he is one of the highest leverage players on 
on the Seahawks team because if he is able to get back to the type of playmaking that he showed as a rookie, then wheels up, you know? I mean, it allows your defense to do so much else. But, Mm -hmm. you know, I I do wonder if the Pritchett pick, who was taken ahead of James, wasn't, you know, designed to to push Woolen a little bit and and maybe – be a little bit of a, you know, a check down play in case Woolen doesn't get back to, you know, the, mm-hmm. the player that we all saw as a rookie. The second bucket from these last four picks are offensive linemen. You have mm-hmm. Satawa Lomea, the guard out of Utah, who I really like. He he was someone I, I tweeted out heading into day three as a target of mine. I was happy to see them pick him. And I will plead absolute lack of knowledge when it comes to Michael Jarrell, who's a tackle out of Finley. Um, are these you have just... a D2 Finley? What's wrong? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, man. I'm a little, I'm a little light on my D2 scouting. Uh, what are FCS. I'm sorry. It's not D2 anymore. Shame FCS. on you for not watching the one player that's ever been drafted out of that school. I know. I know that's on me guys. That's on me. And you know, if you want to unsubscribe from the podcast, I, I get it. I get it. But that's why we have people like Maddie. So they can educate me <laughs> on players like Michael Jarrell. <laughs> so well, I dug my so, own grave there. Yeah, yeah. When you when you look at these two offensive linemen, I mean, tackle. It feels like if Abe Lucas is healthy, obviously Charles Cross has been very promising his first two years. They also brought in George Fant as kind of a, a potential swing tackle player and and maybe some depth there. But with Almea, I. Do you see a player with the type of grit, the type of nastiness that fans want to see from a guard? How do you feel about him? Because he he was someone that was actually recruited pretty heavily coming out of high school, ended up in Utah, and I think played really well. Is this a potential starter there? Starter? I mean, the, the issue for him, obviously, you know, he's right-sided. He's going to be working at right guard and there's Christian Haynes, who is presumably the right guard, along with battling Anthony Bradford. So possibly not. Uh, they, he may be able to do a bit of uh, swing tackle uh, or, or swing guard swing guard tackle. Anyway, right tackle background too. But I think his issue is going to just be like converting to the, to the inside and, um, you know, the pass pro stuff. But we're talking about a, a sixth round pick who, as you said, has... Right. I mean, you put his name in on YouTube and it's like pancake highlights and he's just a nasty type of player. He also has that availability again where he's got so many uh, consecutive starts again. And you think about what what did Mike McDonald and Ryan Grubb say that they wanted the offense to be? Mike McDonald says, we're going to be a physical football team. Ryan Grubb comes in in his first press conference and goes, we're going to be a physical team in Seattle. This is like... I mean, Jarrell, who we can touch on as well, but uh, uh, Laumea, um, Haynes, th- that is two like physical players. Like you got a nasty finisher, and you got a guy who's gonna uh, knock people over, knock people off the ball. It's all this talk about physicality, and it's kind of like a well, yeah, obviously you want physical football. Like, how do you play football without being physical? But it's one thing saying it, but actually acquiring these players who is kind of the standout trait is really um, noteworthy to me and. Yeah, it's again a kind of an experienced football. Schneider said he, they couldn't believe he was, you know, still there. That you know they'd already taken a guard, so it wasn't of the highest priority. But if he's still there in, in the sixth round, like it's a sixth round pick, like let's uh, let's see well, how that looks. Totally, and 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 to your point, I think that if if the NFL came out tomorrow and said, you know what, we're going to expand our game day rosters by two mm-hmm. players, you can dress two more players. I'm guessing most teams would dress two more offensive linemen. Yep. And and it's so hard. You see it. By by the time you get to December, 20 to 24 NFL teams are just struggling at offensive yep. line, right? Because injuries hit and you just don't have the depth and you can't dress enough guys. And so you're mm-hmm. you're piecing it together and entire offenses fall apart because you're relying on a really shallow depth of talent to try and, and fill in for your opening day starter. Balmea profiles to me as a guy who's probably not going to win a starting job coming out of camp is, you know, unless he can learn to play the left side and, and that's a whole different thing, but he is someone where if you need to put him in, I at least feel like he has the ability to engage at an NFL level. 
Yeah, you can you can live with it. It's kind of like the backup core to that conversation, right? Uh, although they're obviously less reliant on that for a win, but it's still important. Like he's not gonna, he's not he'll be a, he'll be very fine in in year one. And I think just that investment in the position, uh, Jackson, as you're saying, uh, you know, we we spoke about uh, earlier the, all these contracts which are like one year deals on the offensive line, right? They hadn't really got any future beyond that at, at the position. So I think it's just an underrated factor having you know, Haynes in the building now, uh, sorry, on the interior of the offensive line, I'm speaking, mm-hmm. obviously, you, you, what a blessing it has. Uh, we'll have to see with Lucas's injury, obviously, that's the big caveat there. But what a blessing it is uh, to have those two bookend tackles in theory. But your interior, like the, the future of the, the guard position was like, we probably need to get some more young guys. And while these are old young guys, they're still rookie contract players who you can see how they would, as you said, uh, be able to fit in do okay, and then um, maybe down the line, you're suddenly like, oh, this guy's developed into a starter. I mean, it's what Green Bay used to do for ages, like just draft the day three guard and suddenly in like three years' time, he'd come in and be like, oh, this guy's an NFL player. Well, that's the most underrated part of it. You know, there's there's so many fans who get so worked up about what teams do or don't do in free agency, and and a common refrain that we have on the show is that the teams that spend the most in free agency are generally bad teams, and they end up being bad teams moving forward. But when you can get a rookie, and even if it's a depth piece, you have them in the provided that they don't stink. You have them in the building for three years, and and they do have the ability to then develop as your presumed starters cycle out either through injury or underperformance or contract issues. You've got these guys in the building that that can develop. Listen, Maddie, you know if if it was up to me, I would talk with you for two more hours about a lot of things on this football team. But I think we covered. A lot of things that are going to be really important to all of us who pay attention to the Seahawks. And I know it's almost midnight there. And so I I want to let you get some well-earned shut-eye. I just want to say thank you so much for making the time to come in and chat with us. Oh, of course. Thanks so much for having me. Um, yeah, my day is just beginning at midnight. I want to know what uh, – well, I – no free ads. I want to know what um what uh you're drinking. All right. <laughs> uh, you know I'm I'm on a Glenfiddich kick right now. Uh, nice. Big Scotch guy over here. But my my main thing is like if I'm gonna drink something when I'm smoking a cigar, it needs to have a certain level of punch to it. Otherwise, mm-hmm. you know, a it's good cigar is just gonna out. wash it out. That's a hundred percent right. And and Glenfiddich does that without sacrificing taste. So I appreciate you asking. Big plug to the sponsor, but. They are sponsors because we love them. So I appreciate you asking. Listen, before we let you go, Maddie, where can the listeners and the viewers find more of you? Well, the Seattle Overload podcast, uh, my Twitter or X or whatever we call that, uh, at Matty F. Brown. And then I have a, a sub stack called uh, SeahawksOnTape.com. I've got an article coming out on the man coverage that McDonald's going to run and like the issues that actually they experienced in the second half of the year and what that looks like in Seattle, what he's going to learn from that. And also had an article explaining how his defensive fronts work, which is pretty pertinent given, you know, the Byron Murphy acquisition and all that good stuff. So there you go. All right, man. I appreciate that very much. Listen, those of you who are watching right now, who are listening on podcast, the goal of this show is one, we want to entertain you, but Two, the goal is to make all of us smarter, myself included. And there is a reason that we brought Maddie on for a a little mini farewell show before we check out for a few weeks here to do some traveling. So, Maddie, again, thank you so much, man. Huge fan of the work that you do. And, uh, man, it it just means a lot that you came across the pond (laughs) virtually to hang out with us tonight. Yeah, one time we'll do it in person. We can. Uh, we can I can't wait stuff. for that. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks for uh, having me. Appreciate it. As always, you can find Mike and I on social media as well. I am on Twitter at, at Jackson Bevins. That's J A C S O N. Remember that no K is okay when spelling my name. Mike is on Twitter at, at Mike Barwin, and the show itself is at Cigar Thoughts. You can catch full video episodes on our YouTube channel at Cigar Thoughts. And find the rest of our socials at CigarThoughtsNFL.com. As mentioned previously, this episode is brought to you by Glenfiddich Premium Single Malt Scotch Whiskey. Y'all know I'm a huge fan of their lineup, and we are thrilled to have them on board as a sponsor of the show. 
If you're watching on YouTube, I re-upped a bottle of their 15-year Solera cask. If you want a scotch that combines an initial kick with an incredibly smooth finish, Glenfiddich is for you. One of the great things about a great scotch is how well it plays with a good cigar. And once again, we do have our own special release of cigars that you can purchase at a terrific price as a listener of the show. The release of these Cigar Thought Stogies has been successful enough for us to continue offering them for the low, low price of $149. That's right, only $149 for a bundle of 10 cigars that normally sell with this blend banded and branded for between $350 and $400. As many of you know, we partnered with one of the most prestigious cigar manufacturers in the world to release these official Cigar Thought cigars, which you can order directly from CigarThoughtsNFL.com. Just follow the link on the show page to get these easy-to-smoke stogies rolled with 13-year-aged premium Dominican tobacco leaf, or hit us up on Twitter or Instagram, as many of you have, and we'll send you the details directly. The cigars come with the Bavita humidification pack and a Mylar storage bag to make sure they stay fresh whether you have a humidor or not. Of course, you can listen to this show and read every article at fieldgoals.com, and if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts and you like the show, Drop us a five-star rating and leave a quick review. Thank you to all of y'all listening for your continued support of the show. We know that you've only got so much time for podcasts in your life, and it's an honor to be a part of that for y'all. Please know that by sharing this show on social media and with your friends, you give us the juice to keep making this happen. We'll be back in a few weeks, but in the meantime, onwards and upwards, my friends. (laughs) 